along with uh, Grand Rounds. Our uh, guest speaker this morning is Dr. Jose Almeida, uh, who is in uh, transplant surgery. Uh, Dr. Almeida is a native of Del Rio. Uh, he didn't tell me which side of the river that's on. Both, Both sides. <laughs> it runs right through the city. Uh, he uh, went, he's lived his whole life in San Antonio after that, though. Uh, he did his undergraduate at St. Mary's University, is a graduate of this medical school, is also a graduate of this general surgery residency, uh, and then did his uh, transplant uh, fellowship uh, at USC uh, with an emphasis on hepatobiliary pancreatic disease. We're glad to have him on the faculty and again presenting this morning. Jose? Thanks. So Dr. Stewart asked me to give this lecture about nine months ago, and I forgot my name on the pamphlet that came out in the email. <laughs> but uh, thanks for the reminder, by the way. <laughs> on this lecture, we're going to talk about what's new. So what I geared this one is sort of a highlight reel of about eight lectures that I have and focused it uh, basically towards you guys. A little bit of a review of some stuff maybe for your for your boards, and then also uh, definitely something about what's new with each of the major topics of the things that we do. Um, regarding an introduction for liver surgery, well, the, the operative mortality used to be pretty high before, and it was always due to bleeding, um, without a doubt. And today, the mortality is less than 5%, and probably even less than that in certain centers. And so the question is, how is it so low? What have we done? Are we necessarily getting better at operating? Well, probably not necessarily that, but a lot of the perioperative stuff that we do, patient selection, and we'll go through some of that. So to start off, we'll go through a little bit of the anatomy, um, some benign le uh, lesions to the liver that we talk about. That's part of the review, um, stuff that I remember from taking my boards. Uh, a lot of my colleagues that had these same questions regarding the liver. There was always a question about what do you do with this mass, a uh, workup of a liver mass? So that's important to know. And then also about metastatic diseases to the liver, because that's the large portion of what we do. And advances in the care regards to what's new, and what's new in advances of care, what's new in methods of transection, if anything, and we'll go from there. So when I was a fellow at USC, um, we had the privilege of doing a lot of patients with uh, of the Jehovah's Witness uh, faith. And so what we hated to do as a fellow is go into two or three liver transplants and then have this one be your next one, because these take a while. So what do you do for that? Do you panic? Do you switch your call? Or do you just uh, face the situation rationally and delay the case until the patient's too sick? Well, you don't have to do any one of those. So let's talk about the anatomy first. Uh, as the residents know through, when they come through our, our service, um, these are the hepatic veins. There's the left, middle, and there's the right hepatic vein. And as you can tell for our transplants, what we try to do is use this common orifice. So probably the residents are most familiar with this area of the hepatic veins. Um, and then the portal veins that are coming in from the bottom. There's a large portion of the left portal vein that's extra hepatic. So when we see CAT scans, and I'll show you some with tumors that are involving the hilum of the area, it's important to remember this part because we can do a lot with this part of the portal vein. And so an intricate web of, of the anatomy, which is important to, to know. When you talk about the resections that we can do, there's non-anatomic non resections. Well, we know that. You know, you can take a big ligature through the liver and do a non-anatomic resection and, and make sure you don't try to get a bile leak. But the formal resections that we talk about that we know are these. So left lateral segment, you know, common that we do for our pediatrics and also for liver resection. So this is segment two and three. You add the left medial segment of the liver, and then you get a left lobe liver resection. The corollary of that is the right, right liver resection. So a right hepatectomy or right lobe is, involves uh, segments five, six, seven, eight. And um, this is this part of the liver. So when you do a right trisegmentectomy, you do not only take out the right, as you guys know, we take out the left medial, because remember that it's left portal vein that's so long, it affords us the option to do that. We can do central liver resections that are not, this is kind of not pictured here with a sort of a 4B, a liver resection from this central area. Those get a little bit trickier. And then probably one of my favorite, which we don't do too often, is a left trisegmentectomy. So described a little bit different, even in a liver textbook, the two volumes, thousands and thousands of pages, there's like a paragraph about this big about left trisegs. 
And so what the left trisag involves is obviously the left lobe and then usually the right anterior lobe as well. And this is what it, ha this is what it looks like right here. So sort of the left lobe in its entirety and then the right anterior lobe. So what you can do when you mobilize this is you can mobilize this entire liver rotated about 90 degrees after you've taken it off the cava, and then you can tell that you kind of just take a huge shark bite straight through this area right here, leaving your right posterior. So that's sort of a fun operation. Um, a little bit of a depiction here, the portal vein. Here's segment 4B, what we talk about sometimes when we do a central liver resection. Um, going over some lesions now. So start off with the benign lesions. Really, there's just three that we talk about, probably three that you guys have to know when you take your boards. I had this question, and Peter Learn had this question, so that's pretty common. It's basically workup of a liver mass, whether it's benign or malignant. You kind of have to go through the things uh, and how to get to there. So there's lesions that arise from the hepatocytes, so adenomas, FNH, regenerative nodules. They're not going to give you this, but this is something that you should know. There's mesenchymal lesions, so hamartomas, common in the pediatrics, angiolipomas, fibromas, uh, really hemangiomas are what you has, have to know. So there's cholangioepithelial tumors, which are a little bit rare, but we do see them, biliary cyst adenomas. Uh, I would venture to say this is not likely for you guys, but maybe you should still know about it. So out of all these, let's talk about three, FNH adenomas and hemangiomas, because those are the ones you guys are going to see. So when you, they start talking about propensity for males or females, it seems like they're all sort of a female predominance here. Uh, so the adenomas, women's 20 to, 20, 20 to 40 years of age. The same thing with the oral contraceptives. You know, when you're talking about your test and you, you're, looking that, you're looking to that to see a risk factor, it's kind of almost all of them will have it, maybe some more than the others of these three lesions. But the clinical symptoms, this is the catcher here, is that these things rupture and they usually cause pain. So out of the hemangiomas, the FNHs, and the adenomas, these rupture. And not to say that the other ones cannot, but if it's going to be a, a common thing on the test question, that's what it's going to be. And this is kind of what they look like. On imaging, so out of, these three, out of these three masses for you guys, what are they like clinically? What do they look like on an x-ray and what do you do about them? So on the x-rays, what they do is, is they have a little bit of a, a high-weighted T2 signal here on the side. And, and this is, uh, uh, the CAT scans are probably the best one. So these uh, are... They're hypodense lesions on the nine contrast images, and on the contrast, they take up some. They do take up some contrast, and they're they're vascular, so they do, but not as much as the F and Hs do. So here, same thing: women, 20s to 30s, uh, increasing the incidence. These are usually asymptomatic. When you go look at a lot of pe people that do laparoscopic liver resections and they publish all their papers, if you go look at the masses that they're taking out, a lot of them are these. So they do come out. Do they have to come out? Mm, just depends. You have discussion with your patient. They're usually benign. This is characteristic of this central scar right here. Um, it's not pathognomonic, but it's also there. And this is, can also be there with the fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma as well. So what about these two? Well, on the, on the T2 images, you'll see the, the scar light up right in the middle there usually. Again, not consistent for all of them, but if you see it, high likelihood that it's that. They do take up contrast. They take up contrast right away. They are vascular, so that's a little bit of a difference between that. And these are Cooper cell uptake. So when you get a um, sulfur scan on these, and the radionuclear colloid Cooper cells will take up the, the dye. So here you go. This one's cold here, so not an FNH. These are three positive FNHs here. And you gave me the full word for FNH. Focal nodular hyperplasia. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Pestana. Hemangiomas. We've talked about three, right? So this is going to be the third one. What do you do for people with hemangiomas? This is one of the most, of the benign lesions that we see, in, at least in, in our clinic, of the benign lesions that come in, these are them. They can be small. They can be large. We try to see them all. We try not to exclude them just right off the back because some of these patients will actually need surgery. A lot of them are found incidental. One of the transplant surgeons that, that trained me she had about 14 hemangiomas of all different sizes of all her liver. And so, you know, we joked about it that one time we we're going to have her in the operating room table and take care of these for her, but she likely doesn't eat anything. So they're, the symptoms can be vague. If they are symptomatic, they usually cause pain. That's the bottom line here. And if they cause pain, then there's an indication. It sort of pulls on your diaphragm type pain, very really rare pain. 
But the, probably the biggest thing is that these things can obstruct or impinge or grow too big to cause certain dangers in which time you say, we better get this out because it's growing, it's, it's blocking off your right portal vein, and this could be a problem for you in the future. Again, the symptomatology is very important for these. So they do come out. Um, Kieselbach Merritt syndrome is sort of a coagulopathy that they can do because you suck up your platelets. It's pretty rare, but I've seen it. Uh, another indication for these to come out. So you guys should remember, why do you take out a hemangioma? Because it's painful. They rarely rupture. But thrombocytopenia and Kieselbach Merritt. But the third reason to take these out is because they can grow so big that they're going to cause impending doom on some major vascular structures. So, structure. so that's the third reason to take these out. So let's review. On your CT scan, going from the bottom up, because that's how we started. So heterogeneous on the CAT scan, that's the way the adenoma is going to show up. Um, the central scars for your focal nodular hyperplasia. Your hemangioma just looks like crap all over. It's picking up some contrast here, not here and others. Uh, it's well demarcated, but it's very heterogeneous as well. The CAT scan, the FNH, again, is going to light up hot in the central scar. Uh, that's going to take up the. That's going to take the, give you your enhancement as well, and then the hepatic adenomas and the hemangiomas. They're hyper in, intense on the T1 for your for your adenomas, and then the hemangiomas as well is hyper intense on T2. So make a little chart for yourself. Go through these. You're going to need this for your boards. I guarantee you. Um, as far as who gets what, the epidemiology. You know, women, young young women as well. Oral contraceptives for your hepatic adenomas, that's what's going to show up for you. Again, the adenomas will rupture, so remember that. Of the metastatic lesions, we'll only talk about three in, the, in lieu of time. And again, each one of these things is like a lecture in and of itself. We're going to talk about colorectal mets, neuroendocrine, which is kind of one of my favorites, and I'll show you why. And then the non-colorectal, non-neuroendocrine. What are those? Those are ovarians. Those are teratomas. Uh, reproductive tracts, and the metastasis from gastric cancer, esophageal cancer, and breast cancer. You're probably thinking, that's stage four disease. What are you even talking about this for? And so you'll see as far as the last one. Starting with colorectal myths. This one really, I don't understand this because in my fellowship, all the metastatic lesions, all the cases that we did were all colorectal cases. Here, I don't understand San Antonio, or at least the referral patterns, because we see almost no metastatic colorectal cases here. So I'm not sure where they're going, but it's important to know because although you guys don't see it often, it's happening somewhere. And there's colon cancer being taken care of and the metastasis to the liver is being taken care of somewhere. You guys just don't see it. That's why I want to talk about it because you'll need to know this. Third most common cancer, 85% <clears throat> will have a surgical, surgically amenable cure. Some will recur in five years. Uh, a portion of those will only recur in the liver. When you say a colorectal met, the first thing is, do you resect or not? They're usually not one. Usually there's a group of them, and they're usually on two sides of the liver, or, um, and rarely are they on just one side. So obviously, if it's amenable to surgery, you operate. If it's not, what well, can you make it operable? So how do you do this? Chemotherapy uh, and reassessment, even portal vein embolization, which we'll talk about again. The way I approach these patients is, are you a responder or are you not a responder? Um, you know, the, one of the first cases I did here was an 85-year-old or 82-year-old lady from Del Rio with uh, a colon cancer in, in her uh, ileocecal area, two centimeters, and a liver lesion replacing her right lobe of the liver, the entire right lobe. And she had AFib, she had had orthopedic surgery to her knees, and so what do you do with that lady? Well, number one, are you a responder or not? Number two, she still had her primary. Uh, and number three, she had been diagnosed with this over two years prior, so almost two years prior. So we did a colon resection on her. Dr. Half helped us take out her entire right lobe, and she did fine, went home in five days. But the point of the situation here is that are you a responder or are you not? Because if you don't respond to any of your treatment, why are you going to do this Hail Mary attempt on her if she's not going to be a responder? So again, can you make it resectable is the question. Are they going to be a responder? The size of your margin for colorectal, again, this is like an entire lecture. The size of your margin for colorectal cancer surgery, metastasis to the liver, is not as important. So a, a true surgical oncologist would love to give you a two centimeter margin around every ligament that's not supposed to be in the liver. But unfortunately, that's not always possible, not with colorectal mets. The size doesn't matter, but you want to take it out. 
and people have done tons of studies. This is part of like an entire one hour lecture here. But people have done tons of studies to see what does matter. What does matter is the number, the size of the tumors, and your CEO, their CEA levels, and the, the surgical margin, whether it's positive or negative. This is important because neuroendocrine is going to be a little bit different. For this, the size of the margin doesn't matter, but you do need a negative margin. Uh, this is a study from Hopkins in 2002. The survival here was 58%. There's a paper after this from MD Anderson that talks about the same thing that came back later on as well. Here's the things that were important, the number of metastases, the margin as well, whether it was negative or positive, and your preoperative CEA level. I've added in a couple of these slides for you just so that you can see what the main, the key things are for here. Um, this is the MD Anderson paper that came out a couple of years after that one. 418 patients, um, 190 of those went straight to resection. Um, and then what do you do with the rest of them? You can RFA, you can resect an RFA, or none of the above. The goals, the reason I put this slide in here for you guys out of those, that I, out of that lecture that I gave is to show you that still the gold standard is really to resect them. If you can take them all out, that's the best option. If you can't, then resect an RFA. If you can't do any of those, then just RFA. And, uh, and this study was the Annals of Surgery um, in 2008 as well. They looked at 930 patients prospectively, and, and just this is kind of the take-home points. How do these patients do? How do they do with colorectal? How do they do with neuroendocrine? How do they do with the breast uh, metastasis to the liver when you operate on these patients? So things that were important were the tumor load, the biology, and what kind of uh, whether or not you got negative margins amongst many. The five-year survival, this one was about 36%. These were some factors. This was a score level that they gave them the tumor size, number of metastases, resection margin, uh, and whether or not it was well differentiated or not, and the CEA level as well. Out of all these studies, they looked at uh, some other studies as well to see what are the things that people think are important when you're taking these colorectal nets out. Um, margin, look, everyone thinks that the margin is important, all these studies, so that's, remember we talked about that margin, you do need to have a negative margin here. Uh, whether or not the CEA level was important or not, bilobar disease is that something else they all agreed upon that it, just because you have METs to both sides doesn't preclude you from surgery. Uh, most people think that the size was important as well. I would venture to say that it's dependent on whether or not it's resectable and whether or not they respond to chemotherapy. Bottom line, the CEA matters, the size matters, but really the number and the location are the, some of the most important things, and you really want to have your negative margin. Neuroendocrine, this one's a really interesting one. Why is it interesting? Because sometimes, these are my favorite ones, and patients will come in with a CAT scan like this, it looks horrible. And, you know, people will be ready to send these guys to hospice. But these are actually some of the guys you can, you can really help out. <clears throat> Neuroendocrine is more of a slow-growing tumor. The five-year survival is actually pretty good, but they need cleanouts. And this is a CAT scan, when I was a fellow, of a guy from McAllen that would go to USC for cleanouts. And he'd been dealing with this, he had an insulinoma, it was non-functional from his pancreas, had a Whipple, and for 10 years, he would go back to USC about every year or every two years, and he'd get a clean out. So he and I developed a connection because I'm from around the area. The river flows downstream, and so that's how I know this guy. And he's a, he's a microbiologist, actually, and he still lives in McAllen. And so for these guys, this is what's in the, the re survival rate for with a complete resection and an incomplete resection, although they're different, you really want to try to remove all the tumor, but look at all these studies. These are a little bit old, but the five-year survival for the neuroendocrines are actually pretty good. So you get out as much as you can. You ablate. You do some of the other techniques that we'll talk about in the end, and you want to debulk them of their disease, and it actually works. And especially if they're responders and they don't grow, it actually works. This is how, so much so that, you know, we rarely transplant for any tumors, but people at you know, that, that, that Dr. Half knows, and, and including Starzl, have this paper that hasn't been finished yet. And it's really only of about 55 to 58 patients, and every year a couple get added on, and it's this ongoing paper that I actually worked on part of it. And what this did is they did liver transplants with abdominal exonerations. <clears throat> Crazy. And they wanted to find out, this is before probably you know, Dr. Half probably knows about this, and before you could actually tell what you could and what you couldn't do with the liver transplant. And there was different types of resections. It was type A, type B, type C. And there were difference based on what organs you took out. You took out the stomach. It was the type liver and the stomach, liver, stomach, pancreas, liver, stomach, 
um, the spleen or, or distal pank, total pank, uh, and different GI operations like that to see what they could do. The only reason I put this up there is to tell you that the only ones that did reasonably well, as you may imagine, taking out a colon and transplanting a liver for colorectal or taking out the stomach and transplanting a liver for metastatic uh, stomach cancer didn't work. And that's what I can tell you. But the only ones that had a reasonable shot were the neuroendocrines. And even when I was a fellow, there was a couple guys that would come into clinic that kind of had this done and were still doing okay. But the other reason to tell you is this is Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs had neuroendocrine of the pancreas, had a Whipple, a met to the liver, if I remember correctly, and then the liver transplant using a sort of a, a different pathway. How, how many years ago was that? I think three years ago, is that right? So again, the neuroendocrines act a little bit differently. I won't go through this slide, but this is uh, sort of what do you do with them, all the different things that you can do, embolization, percutaneous techniques, uh, ablation plus resections. The primary tumor type, jumping on to the none of the above, so these are the metastatic breasts, metastatic ovarian, uh, stomach. The reproductive tract tumors that come to the liver are the only ones that actually do okay. So I was shocked to, say, to do these debulking operations for metastatic ovarian cancer thing, <laughs> or, or metastatic breast cancer thing. What are we doing here? But it was the same thing. If they responded to chemotherapy, you could actually go attack these metastatic lesions and they would actually do okay. This is another, you know, sort of half hour lecture that I give, but you want to, you, you only do it if you can kind of take out everything, number one, that affects your survival afterwards. And the other thing is that the reproductive tract tumors are the ones that do better than the non-reproductive tract tumors. And I, this is your disease-free survival rates. And I got to show you, I thought I had one more slide to show you, but the, the, the three-year survival rate is going to be actually pretty, pretty low for anything that's not breast, for anything that's not reproductive in nature. That's a lot of stuff on these three things. What, do you should, what should you remember? The five-year survival for colorectal is probably about 50%. Neuroendocrines do much better than that. And the non of the above is probably less than 30%, but that's such a wide variety. It just really depends what you're talking about. That's enough of the review for that part of the that part of this thing. What about some new advances that we have? Well, we get some pretty nasty tumors sometimes. This is a cholangiocarcinoma. This is one of Dr. Hauf's, I think. Uh, here, the liver's been resected, and I'll go through it. Cholangiocarcinoma is a nasty is a nasty tumor. The five-year survival is pretty bad across the board. There's an intrahepatic. There's an extrahepatic type. Of those two, the intrahepatics are the ones that do relatively well. The, compared to the extra hepatics, which are the hyalur ones that don't do very well at all. And that's amongst the two. Here we have portal vein involvement, main portal vein coming down here. It's puckered in, coming towards, pulling towards the right with the tumor that's pulling in. Uh, this is the hilum of the liver before resection. Here's the hilum of the liver after resection and the reanastomosis of the portal vein. So what we did is excluded a part of the portal vein, reconnected it together, and uh, did the resection as well. Here's what the liver looks like afterwards. What if we can't do that? What if even that sort of, when you talk about what's new for this, what if your left lateral segment's too small? Uh, this is another case of a different patient with the cholangiocarcinoma. Her left lateral segment's very small. So what we can do is come back to here and we can embolize the portal vein. So portal vein embolization is, I don't know if I would say new, but I would say something that as the techniques get better, we start utilizing it more, but not all radiologists feel comfortable doing it. Ours, we're lucky that ours do. So what you can see here is, these are the clips, these are the coils, I'm sorry, they access it through the skin, they poke the, knee, the liver, they find a portal vein, they advance their catheters, and then they start injecting coils. The coils will embolize the portal vein. So here you can see, here's the left portal vein that ends up remaining. Here's the right portal vein and its branches. Here's where they've accessed the right portal vein. Here's the coils that they've used to embolize, and so what you're left with is the left. What happens? This is a hypertrophy. This is after resection, but I can show you, you know, these are volume measurements that they have done that after they embolize the right portal vein, they get more of the segment four liver that is hypertrophied. And this is about a 17% increase in this case, and after resection, you can see that it hypertrophied. So something like this, uh, the tumor, well, this is probably portal vein embolization is not going to help. So when you embolize a portal vein, what do you think happens? 
Well, most of these patients actually tolerate it okay. We have seen some patients get sort of a cytokine release reaction. They get febrile, they get tachycardic, they get pain, and there's rare cases that they actually get septic. And we're not sure, I don't think, I think it's from a bile leak that maybe that they get that causes them to get septic. Most of them tolerate it well. Once you're doing stuff like this, though, it's this or nothing. So I guarantee you, most of the, almost all the patients that we, if not all, that we tell them it's time for your portal vein to be embolized, despite these risks, they do it. The truth is they tolerate it pretty well. Whether or not the liver grows on the opposite side enough is a question, though. They usually do, but not always. You know, we've done this a handful of times, so I can't tell you we've done this a hundred times. And then what's new in liver surgery? Well, I don't know if this is new, but talk about a Hail Mary pass. Uh, we haven't done this here, but I'm looking forward to a case if you guys find one. So this is when I told you that portal vein embolization probably wouldn't work. So here's an ex vivo resection. So what was done is the liver was taken out, the hilum was clamped, the hepatic veins were clamped, liver was taken off the cava, whether or not the patient went on portal, uh, went on portal venal bypass. Here's the resected liver at the end of the operation. So basically take the liver out, put it on ice, flush it just like you guys see us do a liver transplant, do your resection on the back table, then come back and plug the liver in. So sort of a Hail Mary option. Probably not extremely good for a cholangia, but maybe some other tumor that they've been a responder to and that they tolerate well. Here's the grafts. This is nice because you can go to the back table, put all your grafts in, and then put the, the liver back on. Not so much of a Hail Mary uh, something that is more well proven that's been used and we started using it on the first couple of patients here is the male protocol for cholangiocarcinomas. So what's the male protocol? So cholangiocarcinomas, I've already told you, they're hard to take out. I've already told you that they don't do too well. Some do better than others. So what else can you do for them? Well, what if we just transplant them? Well, that's a crazy idea. You transplant this cholangio and you put them on immunosuppression. But the key is you transplant them but you take away all the crappy nodal tissue from around the area, sort of the ultimate, the ultimate operation for a cholangio, and it seems to be working. And it works in a select group of patients. This is how they do it. The Mayo Clinic is the one that's done it. We've emulated something similar to that. So they get preoperative radiation. The radiation is external or the, uh, and 5-FU, or um, sometimes what we do is do brachytherapy, cannulating the bile duct using interventional, radi uh, interventional uh, GI. They get chemotherapy until their transplant. All of these patients are, uh, go to the operating room for a staging laparotomy before to see if they're still to see if they're still candidates. Some are excluded based on nodal disease. And what they do now also is that they use EUS. They sample all the lymph nodes to sometimes preclude an operation. So I don't know whether or not they're all going to operation right now. It seems like some of them are going to EUS. Uh, they look at the regional lymph nodes. They look for peritoneal mets. They see if the disease is grown. Again, you don't want to take someone that's not really a responder and, and depending on how much it's growing. And the survival rate at the minimum has been at least 58% and some of them higher, some of them, you know, close to the 70s. And so that's kind of comparable to doing a liver transplant for any other disease. So when you talk about what's new for liver surgery regarding cholangios, just remember there's a subset of patients that theoretically might be candidates and it's more the extrahepatic ones, not the intrahepatic ones. Anything new for hepatocellular carcinoma? Dr. Washburn gives an entire hour lecture on just this, but there's nothing that's regarding surgery that's overtly new. There's lots of different treatments based on how sick you are and how sick the patient is. If you can resect them, if they're not that cirrhotic, go ahead and resect them. If they, if they, if they are, have synthetic dys dysfunction and need a transplant, will you put them for transplant? I'll show you guys one slide of Milan criteria because you need to know it probably for your boards. I, someone had a question when I was taking my test. I didn't. Um, and then regarding what else is new, well, what else is new is kind of all the adjuvant stuff. The radiologists get new toys, their chemo embolization, the different yttrium 90 spheres that they're using, the di goal direct, the directed therapies to the, the, the liver, as well as the chemotherapies that we're giving. Milan criteria, basically, they wanted to say for hepatocellular carcinoma, who's going to do okay with transplant? Remember for you guys, Milan is single tumors less than five centimeters. Three tumors, but they can't be bigger than three centimeters. You can't have any an invasion of any vasculature that will take you out. Most places will go with the Milan criteria. Sometimes they'll go up a little bit higher. UCSF said, hey, 
what if we make this a little bit bigger? What if we do a little bit more? And some centers will kind of go with either way. So the UCSF criteria say, we'll go all the way to six and a half centimeters. Three lesions, they can't be more than four and a half centimeters, but they can't total uh, more than eight. Same thing, no invasion. Well, what advances in care have we had? How do we do these things? How do we do these surgeries? So I don't know if this is necessarily called these advances in surgery technique. It's, it's more of just the care. So what you guys know, we always have to have the CVP low. That prevents, uh, there's, and I can show you studies on why that's important, how that's effective. How do you get a low CVP in a patient that you're cutting through their liver and that may be hypotensive? Nitroglycerin, octreotide, uh, we do blood conservation techniques that I'm going to show you guys right now in diuretics. We know that it decreases the blood loss and it also decreases the length of stay. And the blood conservation techniques are what I'm going to show you about right now. When I was a fellow, I worked on this paper, which were blood management programs. You know, I told, we told you guys that we did a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses. So how, how do you save blood? How do you do these operations and save blood? And so what I'm going to show you is that what happened is it started with the Jehovah's Witnesses. So you know that it was established in 1870. Uh, it was an effort to return to sort of this pure, unadulterated Christianity, scripture-based form. And they, they read the scripture and they take it, they take it literally. And it, there's about six million members now. And most of them, you know, you know them for what they do out in the street and their evangelical sort of testaments. But they're more, the things that kind of get them in the news is their hard stance on blood products. So a, when I, a lot of the residents when I was at USC would come on service and say, I don't understand. They won't take blood, but they'll take a liver. And it doesn't make sense to me. Well, it didn't make sense to me either until I worked on this paper. Here's about three or four different scriptures, just as examples of what they believe. But the, the main thing is that the, the, they believe that the life moves. Uh, everything that lives and moves will be food for you. You must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. For your lifeblood, I will surely demand uh, an accounting. So they, they're very adamant that if they take blood, uh, that the, they'll have negative consequences uh, religiously from it. And they're, so in order to respect that, here's what we do. So acute normal volemic hemodilution, um, Dr. Little here and our anesthesiologists uh, that are familiar with this have been utilized this on some of our liver resections, and it works great. It really does. It really works really well. So what we do preoperatively is we actually take away blood from them. We put them in a CPD bag, which has citrate in it to preserve it. You can take about three, or three units of blood out of them. They'll tolerate it just fine. The crit has to be, obviously, uh, a certain amount to, to tolerate this, and they can't have any cardiac dysfunction. But it's amazing to me how well it's tolerated it. For the Jehovah's Witness population, they can't take this blood back if it leaves their circuit, if it leaves their system, because again, they're taking blood back. So they won't accept this blood, even though it's theirs, if it leaves the circuit. So what we do is we leave it in continuity, there's citrate in this, and it's in an ice chest, and then we give that back to them at the end of the operation. We replace that with, uh, they'll take albumin, they'll take colloid, uh, and other sort of volume expansions, and they tolerate it really well. The reason we do this, Dr. Dent can probably give you much better uh, numbers than this, but this is as of about two years ago. It's very expensive to give blood. It's very expensive to give platelets. There's a cost per unit. There's a service fee. Uh, and for the United States, I mean, it's millions and millions of dollars. The, these are the viral infections that you can get. This is as of a few years ago. So CMV, hepatitis B and C, probably less than that now. But what are the complications of getting blood, some acute hemolytic reactions, uh, and transfusion-related lung injury? Probably less and less as we go. But the ANH works great. And it, it's a little bit arduous for some of the anesthesiologists to take on the fact that I'm going to take three units of blood out of this, and he's going to tolerate it. But they usually tolerate it very well. And after the operation, it goes right back in. So the thought is you're losing blood, but you're losing blood that has a hematocrit much less than, much less than it, well, before those units were taken off. Another way to do crazy operations is with good vascular control. And this is a lot of fun. Um, we know that we can do a Pringle. We can do total vascular isolation. We can do uh, partial vascular isolation. That, in occlusion with having a low CVP, uh, there's multiple sort of small studies that show you can do big operations like this on sometimes sick patients uh, utilizing these techniques. So new for surgery, new for techniques. I don't know if this is new. 
but this is some stuff that, uh, that some interesting things that we can do. It's well tolerated to do a Pringle. I always ask the residents to do a Pringle because that's sort of a, a trauma technique as well. And you gotta get into the gastrohepatic ligament. That sometimes confuses them a little bit because this is a thin membrane here. And so you have your hand in there and you're like, how am I gonna get across this? You gotta poke through. But once you poke through, then that's your Pringle. You're, you're encasing your portal vein, your hepatic artery, and your bile duct. And we routinely, we routinely use this and they can tolerate it. They can tolerate a lot of Pringle, 60 minutes reportedly. We don't do it in more than increments of 15 minutes off and on, but they can tolerate quite a bit. If you're cirrhotic, we'll probably want to Pringle a lot less than that and do an intermittent, pr intermittent Pringle. Add in the hepatic veins, left and middle, and then add in the right hepatic vein. Now you got total vascular isolation. This is great. You can do anything. You can let Ide cut through the liver. Where's Ide? He can do it like this. Once you have total vascularization, he, vascular isolation, he won't have any bleeding through this. Ask him about the ligature. We'll go through that right now. Uh, partial is actually, I like this one a lot because, so let's say you're just doing a right lobectomy or you're doing something on the right, just isolate the right portal vein, isolate the right hepatic vein, isolate the right hepatic artery. This continues to get blood flow to it and uh, that, that'll be safe. So it's a little bit more of a compromise. Intraoperative ultrasound has been very important. Here is a tumor involving the right posterior segment. So, you know, they were thinking that they do a right posterior liver resection. On the ultrasound, you can see that the right hepatic vein is involved. And so right through there is, is, is what you have to do, a right lobectomy. So ultrasound has become very important. We do it on our liver transplants now. Uh, intraoperative ultrasound is, is very good. The other thing you need to know about this is that not just any ultrasound is recommended. People, some diehard liver surgeons will say if your ultrasound machine is less than about, is from 2007 and below, it's not digital, the gain isn't as good, and so that's not the best ultrasound to be doing. I'll show you that, why it's important for some of the toys that we use. But intraoperative ultrasound, but a good intraoperative ultrasound is kind of what you need. This is a new toy for us that's probably been around for a while with, uh, um, where's Ash? Ash saw us use this yesterday. This has probably been around for a while. Uh, the plastic surgeons use this on their free flaps quite a bit. So what this is is an indwelling vascular probe. Remember we're talking about things that are new. Well, this is new to us. Uh, the, this is the, actually the, the Doppler probe right here. This is just like getting a Doppler box like the vascular surgeons do and sticking it on an artery. But this you can leave wrapped around. This is a silicone wrap that goes past your anastomosis. You can either put a clip or a stitch here. And this will stay in the patient for you know, seven to 14 days, they say. And at the end, when you're done monitoring, so this is a continuous Doppler monitoring the entire time, just like having a Doppler probe on it. And you, you can connect up to two probes up to this little old antiquated box. Technology is probably not new, but this is probably newer and uh, have full-time monitoring. So some small vessels, the plastic surgeons use it often. Uh, we started using this on the pediatrics and we tried it on a, one of the adult liver transplant patients as well. And it's actually pretty neat. So is this gonna save them? Is this gonna provide any heroic efforts? Well, I think for, for what this will do, I actually had an aunt had this and she had a free flap done after her breast cancer and her, her tram went down. And because they had this in there, they called the surgeon at three in the morning. They took the patient back at Methodist at four in the morning. They took her back and they revascularized the artery and she did fine. So it's actually pretty interesting. What are some methods of transections that we can use? You guys don't see us use very much, but when you, if you leave, when and if you leave, hopefully you leave, you'll see other things that, that people use. So it's important for you to know. We'll talk about just the ablative techniques. I won't talk about radio frequency ablation. That, that's a thermal ab ablation that you guys are common with. Cryoablation came into vogue, it's kind of come in and out, and that's basically cold uh, ablation that's used to necrosis cell membranes. Microwave ablation is real expensive, and some people really like it, but we don't use it. I've actually never used it. Um, some patients, some people have described putting nanoparticles into the liver tumors. You put this nanoparticles in, um, tiny little particles, usually some kind of gold mediated, um, they work on this in Louisville, Kentucky. And then you, you shine infrared light on the tumor and it makes the particles vibrate so much and the tumor dies. Uh, and then nano knife. Nano knife I will tell you guys about because we do use it. It is part of this what's new. This is definitely new. So we know we've been doing 
reversible electroporation to insert viruses and vectors into cells all the time. That's old school. This is, this, that was, uh, this is irreversible electroporation. All you're doing is you're putting two probes in around a tumor. You electrocute it. This, it doesn't die by thermal ablation. It dies because it causes nano-sized, nano hence the term nano-knife. They're very creative. Size pores within the cell membrane. Cell membrane leaks. Cell membrane dies. You get apoptosis. Uh, and and uh, that's how you have death from, for this. We did the first pancreas patient. We actually did this on the pancreas about uh, nine months ago. We were the first ones to do it in Texas. She had a neuroendocrine tumor to the liver, neuroendocrine tumor to the pancreas. She was elderly. She didn't want to whipple. She, so we did a liver resection, and we took care of her small pancreatic head tumor with the nano knife. Why use the nano knife? The reason to use the nano knife instead of RFA, instead of cryo, instead of any other ablation technique, is because you can nano knife the crap out of a vessel, and it'll it'll be okay. Why can you do that? It doesn't cause any damage, so you can have a tumor right on the hepatic vein, and I thought I had a picture in there, and you can nano knife where you couldn't nano knife, where you couldn't RFA before. And so you, you're adding in this new population of patients that weren't candidates because it was on the right hepatic vein, but you cannot do it. So the thought is the regenerative process is involved with re-electroporation. So even if you screw a, a hepatic vein with the electroporation, that cell membrane will come back. Cell membrane from the tumor will not because of the, the genetics of it. And you know, at Louisville, Kentucky, they have a ton of patients that are actually doing really well from this. It's expensive, though. So you're not going to do this on all your patients. This isn't first line. It's kind of cool, but it's not necessary. To select a set of patients. The other way this is being doing, done, this is a liver lecture, but for tumors that involve the portal vein or the celiac artery, what they'll do is they'll stick the probes in on one either side. You can go right through the SMV if you have to, or next to it. You don't want to go through it, but you can go right through the SMV, electrocute it, cause electroporation, and not cause any damage to it. People have been accentuating their margins like that. What about the CUSA? It's not new, but you guys maybe should know about it because other places use it. Uh, on the West Coast, when I used to go on the liver donors, when they'd split the liver, it's so funny. People would come in with a, a cart full of all these toys. You know, they fly into a donor hospital and they'd lug around this cart and had all this kind of crap with it. It's actually interesting. So ultrasonic surgical aspirators, it's by Tyco. Uh, I remember actually using this at Wolford Hall a long time ago when I was a resident. And um, it cuts through the liver tissue, fragmentate, fragments it with ultrasonic energy, and is sucking it out at the same time. And what it's supposed to do is leave your vascular structures. That's what these all do. They're supposed to leave your vascular structures intact. It's supposed to lower the blood loss. Um, but it really takes a long time. And it takes a long time. I don't have the patience for this. Harmonic scalpel, you know, I should have put the ligature on here, uh, especially for eye, probably. Uh, everyone says, yeah, yeah, I can do it, I can do it. So they clamp on the pad, they clamp on this big ligature, yeah, yeah, I know how to do it, I know how to do it. Squeeze the knife, knife goes right through, they forgot to ablate it, everything bleeds. So you do have to practice a little bit. So uh, the harmonic scalpel vibrates. <laughs> What's that? That's not the insulin. Yeah. Uh, the harmonics, he's not the only one. He learned how to do it now. It was only one time, yeah. It was, it was, only, a, <laughs> it was only the portal vein, but it's okay. Uh, it vibrates, the harmonic scalpel vibrates. It cuts and it coagulates at the same time. So different from the ligature, ligature has a blade in it. The harmonic scalpel doesn't have a blade in it. It'll seal vessels two to three millimeters big. People use it with laparoscopic. Um, they say that it's cooler temperatures. If you put your fingers next to the ligature when you're cutting through it, it gets pretty hot. The harmonic scalpel doesn't get as, as hot, but the concern would be, it's always been for bio leaks from that. This thing is expensive. This is basically an RFA in four probes, and it looks like a whale harpoon. And it costs about $3,000, um, but the price has been lowered for a special price for, for us now. Uh, this, is great for, this is great for cirrhotic livers. So what this does is it has four prongs, and amongst the four prongs, you get this just huge eschar. I mean, you can go through a hepatic vein, use this through it, and uh, within reason, it'll actually coagulate it quite nicely. Then you can just get your finger and just cut right through it. So this is the Habib. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I make fun of it, but actually it's very useful in cirrhotic patients because that's really the only thing for some degree of fibrosis that they'll tolerate the bleeding. 
and where you take your bovine and cut through the liver in a cirrhotic, it's a nightmare. With this thing, you can actually stick it through and it's very helpful. So that we've been using, reserving this, because it's expensive, we reserve this for the cirrhotic patients that usually need a non-anatomic wedge resection. It's a large resection plane. It's pretty fast, actually, and you can use it laparoscopically. Um, one anecdote about this, so this is, it's important to know, just like the RFA probes, this can cause damage to surrounding structures. And I know of one place that had a really bad intraoperative injury because um, they left the fellow, the fellow ins uh, inserted this through a lesion to the left uh, lateral segment and accidentally went into the esophagus. Uh, the patient presented about three days later with an upper GI bleed because there had been a fistula between the aorta and the esophagus and there wasn't a good thing and the patient expired, unfortunately, from a big fistula. And so all these things you've got to be aware of surrounding. To me, it seems so simple. You put your right hand around behind, make sure that if anything gets Habib, it's your hand and not the esophagus. <laughs> Um, this machine is really, really cool. It's an ERBI. I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's a laminar liquid jet rotating drill-like system that's about $100,000, but it's really cool. And so this almost acts like taking, taking the liver to the local car wash and blasting it with the pressure hose. Um, it also aspirates at the same time, and it really works nicely. Uh, it'll, let me see, I think I have a little bit of a video here. This is a laparoscopic case. No, let's see if it'll play. This is a laparoscopic case, and I'll just fast forward to the important part to show you what the Irby can do. So here's the jet. It's maybe a little bit hard to see, but What's, what you'll see is that it, it goes through the tissue that's not going to bleed and it leaves those little tiny veins open uh, and, and intact and it needs a little bit of tension to the left side of the liver, a little bit of tension to your right side of your transection point and uh, it's very easy to use and then what you do is you just place a clip across those. And so this is, this is one of the things that Stanford would bring on our pediatric live donors amongst like two other machines that they'd bring in and this was one of them that they'd bring into each case. And it's super expensive, uh, but it's actually a lot of fun to play. And then they even talked about their tower of power because you add argon and bovi to this whole thing, and it's like $150,000. And it's a really cool toy, but it, it's uh, probably not ne that necessary. Tissue link is something kind of similar to it. It's old school, takes a long time. It's saline link linked with uh, radio frequency energy. Uh, it needs a nice transection point, but it takes too long for me. One of my favorites are the staplers. There's a difference between Ethicon staplers. This is another thing. I, I know how to use a stapler. I know how to use a stapler. Next thing, I'm taking Ide's finger out of the stapler because he accidentally transects the stapler. So there's Ethicon and there's uh, EndoGIA. What's the difference between the two? The difference is this the C-arm mechanism that the Ethicon has. It's literally like a, like a C. And so if you have a whole bunch of tissue distal to your staple line, it's going to cut right through them. These guys claim the fame, they're more expensive, we don't have a contract here, is that it's an H or I beam type mechanism, so it kind of sandwiches everything down nice and neat. Um, there's one thing I did, so when you guys see us ask for the different loads, um, the green load is more for bowel stuff because the staple is bigger, it's a two millimeter staple. The blue load is kind of good for sort of a universal, a little bit of everything, but the one we really use for the liver is the white load. These are one millimeter, one millimeter size. This isn't going to be on your board, but you guys should know about this because you see us ask for different ones. Sometimes I'll actually use a gray load because they're really, really fine. But you can't do a lot with that, but uh, this is good for the really fine veins and arteries. Um, I'll spare you that promotional video. Um, the staplers are fast. They're, hemos they're pretty hemostatic. You might get some bile leaks but they do cause bleeding. There's a guy named um, Joseph Buell in Kentucky who's a transplant surgeon and a liver surgeon. And I remember I did a couple of courses with the guy and he would do laparoscopic liver resections. And that was this sort of thing. He'd do big right lobes laparoscopically or with a hand port. It was so fun to watch it because it was so ugly. Uh, he'd have about 12 staplers loaded up, ready to go. He'd stick his hand in there, and he still does it, actually. And I, I think the patients do relatively well, but it's not pretty whatsoever. Uh, but he, he gets a stapler, and he just jams, and he starts going one after the other. And the, the tech just passes him staples, staples, staples. There's blood everywhere, 
And at the end, the tumor, the liver comes out, he puts a big lap on it, and he argons the rest of it. it takes him about 45, 30 minutes, and it's not pretty. And I remember I even killed a pig. I said, I can do that. So in the pig lab, I started doing that, the pig died. So I don't recommend it. But it's just so that you know, staples can be used to transect all that area. Uh, we use it for selective areas. We use it, you know, the right portal vein, the right hepatic vein. It's very useful. I started using it to do a little bit of the transection of the liver, but it gets really messy, and Dr. Hauff doesn't like it, so we stopped doing it. <laughs> and the serenic ultimate dissector this is the, probably the bovi. The bovi works, you know, the bovi works great. The, um, we, this is all we would use, and this is probably the best thing. You open up a little bit of the liver, give it just a little bit of tension. You can do blunt dissection with the bovi. You can bovi through small veins. You can use it to dissect out things that you're going to have to clip. And really, it was so interesting because, you know, Stanford would come in with this big, giant cart, and we would just come in with the bovi and some clips and get the same thing done. So just so you know, you can do all this with all kinds of stuff. And it's sometimes just the bovi will work. Um, in summary, you know, remember, adenomas will rupture. The five-year survival rate for colorectal is okay. Neuroendocrine is actually really good. Um, none of the above, like uh, breast cancer and ovarian, some patients will do actually good. You want to avoid the excessive blood transfusions. Mayo protocol is something new. We've started here for cholangias. It can't be resected. And uh, that's all I have for you guys. Thanks. Is the uh, triple phase still the gold standard for hepatocellular? Because our radiology colleagues, we sent a patient who had cirrhosis and we found two lesions. Their recommendation was an MRI. And I think we called one of you. Is, so it still is, right? Portal vein washout is supposed to be pathognomonic for a cellular within the, within the good. So it takes up the contrast, it washes out on your second phase, which is your portal vein phase, and that should be pathognomonic right now. Do you think that now? The CAT scan, I think, is still the gold standard. Plenty of people use an MRI. They're pretty interchangeable. If we have an atypical lesion and they've had one or the other, we'll try uh, the other one, and sometimes it's helpful. Uh, question, please. Uh, that was a beautiful review, by the way. In the days when I was still practicing, those liver adenomas due to the birth control pills were a real problem. We saw them all the time. But birth control pills have been around since the 1960s, and they keep changing the formulations to make them better, presumably with fewer side effects. Do you still see those adenomas as a frequent clinical problem? We see it, I don't know how frequent, maybe once or twice every couple of months, but we do see it. Of course, that's what we did in my time, so I guess incidence hasn't changed that. Thank you. Uh, well, that was a great talk. Um, question for you. You were talking about the, um, the uh, hemangiomas and sort of defining a time when, okay, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause you a problem. Um, when, once you found one, and what is the timing for screening in terms of, you know, interval CTs? And then I guess uh, at what point do you say, okay, we're, we're pulling the trigger. We've got to do something about it. Yeah, can, I, can I pile on to that? I was going to ask you basically for the residents, the benign liver tumors like hemangioma, uh, when do you go to resection? Because on your oral boards, Something's going to happen to that patient that is supposed to force them to go resect, whether it's a, a focal nodular hyperplasia, an adenoma, or an angioma. Um, when do you go to resection, which is kind of a pile on to Richard's question? Um, certain hemangiomas, you can see them in clinic and tell them to forget that they ever had this, based on how big it is and where it's at. Um, the, the second question is when do you operate? Pain? Impinging doom, <clears throat> so this thing's growing in a bad place, <clears throat> excuse me, or hisopopomeric thrombocytopenia. Most common of those three, pain. Uh, people will then say, well, I'm a football player. Am I going to get hurt from playing with this hemangioma? The answer is usually no. Uh, depending on how big it is, some people should tell them not to. But the first thing is screening. You can kind of forget about it if, it doesn't, if it's not an impending problem. If it's in a bad place, it's going to grow. Maybe a CAT scan is 6 to 12 months. Immediate absolute contraindication, take this out, usually it's pain, growing too big, or thrombocytopenia. This is quite a display for um, 
tremendous topic that you cover everything. I have a couple of questions. Hemangioma. Dr. Uh, Schwartz, I had a, a long talk with him once. He came in to give us a grand round and I asked him, Sai, you, you, you published the largest series of, of hemangiomas. And Henry Bismuth reviewed the entire French literature and he had only 35 rupture in the entire France. And his answer said, no, they were not bleeding. Our pathologist is very compulsive. He, he, he took serious cuts and he found an adenomas in these, associated with these hemangiomas. Said so we do not operate on hemangiomas, unless they are kids, like you said, Kesselbach, they thread platelets and so forth. Now another thing I want to ask you, have you read the New England Journal of Medicine, the last issue? What's coffee has to do with hepatic cell carcinoma? Apparently it has a favorable coffee. How, how, explain that mechanism to me. Diabetes. Um, and diabetes also. Yeah. It's better for, good for diabetes and for HCC. Yeah. What, the what's what's, I what's the know, secret behind it? Some kind of antioxidant maybe? I'm not sure. I'm Dr. Alf, do you know anything about it? No. Go back to Dr. Dent's question for one yeah. minute. Yeah. Um, very few hemangiomas less than 10 centimeters are going to be symptomatic. And if you do operate on them, most of them you can enucleate. Right. That's important to know. For focal nodular hyperplasia, you're going to operate most commonly if you can't decide if it's a malignant tumor or not. Sometimes they're atypical and you end up taking them out for diagnosis, less commonly for pain. Adenomas, if it's a woman of childbearing age, quote unquote, and it's resectable, you want to take it out because there really is a significant incidence of bleeding and there's a small incidence of malignant degeneration which is very real. We have seen that. So if it's resectable, it should be taken out. Sure. Yeah, and so along those lines, what would be a safe board's answer for when to uh, resect colorectal metastases uh, in today's era? Um, if they're responder to chemotherapy, number one. If, it's, uh, if you can get a negative margin, number two. Uh, which are probably the two most important things for taking out colorectal meds. A, you got to be able to take it all out. B, they have to respond to their, their treatment to begin with. Anything else you can think about? Well, the results are much better if they have three or fewer three lesions. Or fewer. So you'd always take those out. But there's enough data to say that even if they have five or six lesions, if you can take it out with a negative margin, especially in a younger patient, you should because you'll be helping a significant proportion of them. Okay, and then with that, would you ever do it at the time of your colon resection? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, is, if you're going to, for a board, the answer is we have, and that's what we used to do all the time. Yeah, the CT scan showing. With the CT scan that's showing. Uh, mm -hmm. And so from a board question, A, we did that, that's what we did commonly with going to colorectal surgery. There were two colorectal services at USC. We would do them simultaneously. That was standard there. But your question is going to be you're doing a colon cancer, you happen to find this, what do you do? And that's how we get most of our few referrals for colon uh, The answer is take it out if you can. They're going to ask you, are you familiar with this? Are you comfortable with this? You answer based on your, your experience. And uh, so you basically take it out if you can. If it's easy, you know the cancer that shows what you're going for. But there, there's no downside to saying I would delay. Absolutely not, no. For, for a safe board answer, it probably would be. Well, the, there is one downside. I mean, I mean, this is an interesting question because it requires two operations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess there is, but it is that it's not. A, that, that's a downside. I mean, sort of an ideal world that you have these two services that intermingle and you plan this ahead of time and you have two yeah, sets of people who do this. To take it a step farther, a lot of it depends on um, where the tumor is because you may need these incisions. And a lot of people would give chemotherapy first uh, because they think it's going to have two advantages. One, if it's very aggressive biology, more tumor will show up and you'll know that that's the case. And two, because by definition, it's metastatic disease, the chemotherapy may decrease the recurrence rate. So how would you answer on the boards today? If Because I think that the most common scenario is not what you said. The, the certain scenario will be... You've got a patient, you get a pre-op CAT scan, they have a sigmoid colon cancer, and they have, col they have metastasis to the liver. My answer uh, would be 
in general, I would do it as two operations and give chemotherapy in between. But if it was a very small, easy to get to single lesion, I would take it out. But what's happening here, the reason that you're not seeing it is our medical oncologist with stage four disease like that, with multiple, not just the solitaire, but they're treating patients with chemotherapy. We are not resecting the colon cancer first, uh, unless, it, unless the patient either bleeds or obstructs. Is that correct? Well, I, mean, I think it varies, and this raises a, an issue, an issue that it goes beyond the teaching function of this conference. You've identified a, a logistic problem within the, our professional community. These decisions are made, by and large, at a committee level, uh, a board level that meets weekly, that you're not involved in. And if we wanted to more intelligently address this issue, you should be involved in that combined uh, tumor board because that's the time that these decisions are made, and they vary from one patient to the next, and they're not always logical. Good point. The other thing that we've seen is we've seen, we've seen the hepatic lesions regress, and then we've seen the primary grow, mm -hmm. almost to the point of being unresectable under right. those circumstances. Another interesting question is if you've taken out the primary and you give chemotherapy and the liver lesion disappears, should you resect it? And the data would support resecting it because a lot of those still have microscopic disease and a lot of them recur. When Mary Pat Moyer was on the faculty, that was one of the areas that she was looking at. And she showed that there was different tumor biology between the primary colon cancer and the liver mets when she was growing them uh, in vivo, uh, in vitro. Uh, what about large hepatic cysts that you unroof? Pain mainly? Uh, pain, size, growing, small chance of malignant transformation, depending on how big it is. Important thing to enucleate it as best you can. And what about gallbladder cancer? Bad. Gallbladder cancer well, is bad. Because when we see it, either it's resectable by accident, and we find it incidentally, or it involves the porta. And we don't seem to see any grade in between. Yeah. The and no good chemotherapy. Resect it if you can get it all out, but it's a tough one. Dr. Howell. And about cysts. If it's a simple cyst, you generally need to do nothing. If it's a septated cyst, you worry about a biliary cyst adenoma, which has malignant degeneration, and you should <coughs> take it out. Oh, Dr. Phillips. So, on the topic of <coughs> simultaneous colorectal and liver resections, there's a guy called Nordlinger did a trial. Uh, pretty extensive one. He suggested that if there's more than three comorbidities significant, then your intraoperative, perioperative mortality increases. There is no long-term difference between doing it simultaneously or staging it in patients who've been who've had preoperative chemotherapy. So if they call you intraoperatively, it doesn't make sense to do it then. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. I was going to say that I thought Habib was one of our residents. <laughs> <laughs>